Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's public hearing with the CFPB Task Force on Federal Consumer Financial Law. Uh, we wish we could all be together today in person, but we're pleased so many of you have been able to join online. My name is Matt Cameron, and I serve as the Assistant Director for the Office of Stakeholder Management here at the Bureau. Today, we're going to hear from four panelists who are economic and legal scholars in a wide range of topics in the field of consumer financial protection. Their feedback today will help the task force as it works to produce a set of recommendations to the director early next year. Uh, thank you to the members of the task force and our distinguished panel of experts for being with us today. Uh, we're thrilled to have such a wide array of viewpoints here. Uh, I'd like to briefly share the format of today's public hearing. First, we'll hear from Director Kraninger. Um, and then Task Force Chair Todd Zawicki will briefly introduce the members and panelists before beginning their discussion. Uh, then the majority of our time is going to be spent hearing from our panelists. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, each panelist will deliver opening remarks. And then the Task Force members will introduce five topics, then direct opening line of questions to one of our panelists. We have just over 10 minutes per discussion item, uh, which will provide time for all the panelists to share their thoughts on each topic. As a reminder, the views of our panelists are greatly appreciated, but they don't represent the views of the CFPB. You can find inform it, more information about the task force and this public hearing on our website at consumerfinance.gov. With that, I'm now pleased to introduce Director Kathleen Kraniger. Director Kraniger became the second confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in December 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role establishing the Department of Homeland Security, to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget to the CFPB, Director Kraninger has dedicated her career to public service, and it's my privilege to welcome her to today's meeting. Director Kraninger, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we continue to CFPB's events uh, celebrating Consumer Financial Protection Week. For the past few days, we've heard about the Bureau's important work protecting consumers. Despite the nationwide disruptions being caused by the coronavirus, the Bureau continues its daily work to help all consumers in the consumer financial marketplace. Moving to today's public hearing of the Bureau's Task Force on Federal Consumer Financial Protection, I'd like to thank the CFPB staff, the task force members, and the panelists for their participation this afternoon. The task force was convened to examine the existing legal and regulatory landscape facing consumers and financial services providers and make recommendations for ways to improve and strengthen consumer financial laws and regulations. Let me set the stage a bit for the task force's work. The Dodd-Frank Act, the Bureau's organic statute, states that the purpose of the Bureau is to implement and, where applicable, enforce federal consumer financial law consistently for the purpose of ensuring that all consumers have access to markets for consumer financial products and services, and that markets for consumer financial products and services are fair, transparent, and competitive. A broad and significant mandate, but one that is also built on 50 years of enumerated federal consumer financial laws, now under the Bureau's purview for nearly 10 years. And many of the consumer financial laws passed in the 1970s stemmed from the work of a body established by law in 1968, the National Con Commission on Consumer Finance, or the NCCF. The NCCF was chartered to conduct original research and provide recommendations relating to regulation, the regulation of consumer credit. The report led to significant legislative and regulatory developments in consumer finance. We know a lot has happened in the decades since the NCCF report in law, in the regulatory landscape, and in advancements and innovation in consumer financial products and services. And certainly notably, given where I am right now, the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Furthermore, with 10 years since the DFA's enactment, we have experience to apply in thinking about opportunities for clarification, improvement, and modernization. Therefore, now is the right time to take a step back and holistically evaluate how we can fulfill our objectives and functions in the, more in the most effective and efficient manner. We are lucky to put together such a strong and capable group of dedicated public servants, 
in this task force. When we established the task force, I directed the members to not just consider the work done over the 10 years since the Bureau was created, but also to look back at the history of consumer financial protection and regulation and use that to help us prepare for the next 10 years. I look forward to seeing the recommendations and considering the next steps from there for the Bureau. Next steps could include a request to Congress for legislative action, items for the Bureau's regulatory agenda, coordination with changes with other federal regulators, promotion of new federal state working relationships, or engagement in further research. Today is a public opportunity for the task force to engage a panel of experts and for those panelists to help inform the task force's work. Let me end by thanking you again for joining. Thank you to Todd for serving as the chair of this important group. You and the entire task force have spent your careers to improve markets for consumers. We're thankful for your service and that you have agreed to join the Bureau to once again answer the call to help America's consumers. Finally, thank you again to the panelists for joining us today and very much look forward to hearing your views and perspectives. Thank you, Director Kraninger, for those opening remarks and thank you on behalf of all the task force and task force staff for your support for what we've been doing um, and trusting us with this mission on behalf of America's consumers. Thank you, uh, um, everyone, for being here, and good afternoon. Thank you for being here for the CFPB public hearings hosted by the Task Force on Federal Consumer Financial Law. I, my name is Todd Zawicki. Um, as you've heard, I serve as the chair of the Task Force. I'm also a professor of law at George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School, senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and former executive director of the George Mason Law and Economics Center. I'm going to keep my comments brief, uh, but we'll provide a short background and update on what the task force has been up to since we were uh, formed in January, why this work is important, and then talk about some of our goals for today's hearing. Before that, I would like to introduce the members of the task force and the members of our panel. I'm joined on the task force by Gene Noonan, Bill McLeod, Tom Durkin and Howard Beals, or as I like to call them, the dream team of consumer protection. Uh, each member of the task force has committed their career to improving the health of Americans' financial system and consumer protection, and each has a very long and distinguished record of public service. I will avoid um, what could easily become a very long introduction for all of them by just sharing a few highlights of each of our members and their commitment to public service um, and why it's such an honor for me to serve with them on this on this project. Uh, Bill and Howard are former both former directors of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. Tom was a senior economist in the Division of Research and Statistics at the Federal Reserve Board, and Gene was both associate director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission, as well as general counsel of the Farm Credit Administration, which supervises the nation's agricultural and rural lending uh, cooperatives. All in, we have uh, over 150 years of professional experience um, working in this area, and as you can hear, extensive leadership positions um, within the consumer protection uh, uh, field and consumer finance. On behalf of my colleagues, it's an honor to be asked to serve the American consumer through this initiative. Today, we are also joined by a very distinguished panel of experts, and we look forward to hearing their views as their expertise will surely add to the recommendations that the task force will develop. It is my honor, I will introduce each of them in turn um, now, and then each of, introduce each of them uh, when their turn comes to make opening statements. It's my honor to introduce first Professor Vernon Smith. Professor Smith was awarded the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002 for his groundbreaking work in experimental economics. Uh, Dr. Smith has joint appointments at the Arguros uh, School of Business and Economics and the Fowler School of Law um, at Chapman University, and he is part of a team that has created and will run the new Economic Science Institute at Chapman. Joining Professor Smith is Professor Mirsa Baradaran. Professor Baradaran is Associate Dean and Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Baradaran is the author of several books, including The Color of Money, Black Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, and How the Other Half Banks, Exclusion, Exploitation, and the Threat to Democracy. Her research focuses on financial inclusion, racial inequality, and banking regulation. 
Next will be Dr. Vicky, Vicky Bogan. Professor Bogan is an associate professor of finance in the SC Johnson College of Business at Cornell University. She is founder and director of Cornell's Institute for Behavioral and Household Finance, which studies investment decision-making behavior with the goal of shedding light on how to better model financial behavior and inform pol related policies and regulation. Finally, Dean Marcus Cole is a leading scholar of the empirical law and economics of commerce. His research has explored questions such as why corporate bankruptcies are increasingly filed in Delaware and what drives the financial structure of firms backed by venture capital. He was appointed as Notre Dame Law School's Dean in 2019 after serving for 22 years as a faculty member at Stanford Law School, where he held two endowed chairs and taught courses in the areas of bankruptcy, banking contracts, and venture capital. Dean Cole's extensive legal and scholarly background includes serving as a national fellow at the Hoover Institution, a fellow at the University of Amsterdam Center for Law and Economics, and a visiting professor at several institutions around the world. He also has held numerous advisor roles for government agencies and nonprofit organizations. We also extended an invitation to uh, some other potential panelists who uh, have, have not joined us today. We regret not being able to hear their views, but thank you to each of our panelists who we do have today for agreeing to share your exp expertise and perspectives with us today. So what is the task force? Why does it matter? And what is this panel helping us to do today? As Director Craninger mentioned in her opening remarks, the task force is in part inspired by the National Commission on Consumer Finance, which was created to conduct original research and to provide Congress with recommendations relating to the regulation of consumer credit. The commission's report contains original empirical data information and analysis, all of which undergird the report's final recommendations. The data, findings, and recommendations for the commission were made public, and the report led to significant legislative and regulatory developments in consumer finance. Similarly, this task force will examine the existing legal and regulatory environment facing consumers and financial service providers and will publish a two-volume report of our findings and recommendations. Uh, incidentally, the, uh, um, the NCCF report was issued in 1972, so it's about the 50th anniversary of uh, the, the NCCF, um, which, uh, uh, and, and it's an honor to follow in their footsteps for all of us. For our report, the first volume will cover uh, five key topics regarding financial products and services. That, and we will, uh, that we will focus on in our discussion today. Those topics are a review of the legal framework of consumer protection, consumer information and education, competition and innovation, regulatory modernization flexibility, and inclusion and access to financial products and services. The, uh, the task force will use the insights gained in that uh, research to develop a second volume that will include a set of recommendations for the Bureau on ways to improve and strengthen the application of financial laws and regulations. All of this activity is centered on the underlying principle of strengthening consumer protections in the financial marketplace in accordance with the CFPB statutory mandate. We are committed as a task force to ensuring the public can inform our work through transparent and inclusive engagements. To, uh, to help scope our work, we held a listening session with representatives from various consumer advocacy and trade groups. We also issued a request for information and reviewed comments from prior information submitted by the public, such as responses to the call for evidence RFIs the Bureau issued in 2017. Like many other things, we had an active um, uh, schedule of public engagement planned for the spring, but the uh, intervention of the, uh, the, the, the pandemic um, obviously is, um, made, th made that more difficult. In the future, we plan to engage with our state and federal regulatory partners, as well as the Bureau's various advisory committees in the fall. The insights from today's public hearing will serve as a guidepost for the recommendations that we will ultimately share with the Director. Our intention is to hear from each panelist and not to share our viewpoints or thoughts on these topics. On this note, we are excited to hear from the range of experts today. We are eager to discuss opportunities to strengthen our nation's marketplaces and improve the protection of our consumers. So, Thank you again, all of you, for coming. Thank you for the witnesses for being with us today and for all of you for listening. With no further ado, I would like to begin today's meeting by turning it over to the panelists for opening remarks. And I will first ask Professor Vernon Smith if he would start us off. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Let me begin by asking, can you hear me all right? We can. Hello? You can, can hear, hear you. Okay. All right. I want to start by speaking to the generic problem in all asset markets. And this may help to focus the mission and some of our discussion. The fundamental problem we face stems from the retradability of durable assets, whether a house or a security. Thus, consumer producer markets for non-durable studied in the lab easily and quickly find supply and demand equilibria. And in the macroeconomy are a rock of stability. Let me remind you that 75% of private product expenditures are for non-durable. This stability is because non-durables have value in use, only value in use, and this is rigidly reflected in their value in exchange. I want you to think of hamburgers, haircuts, and hotel rooms bought only to use, not resell. This explains the spectacular success of transport deregulation, air, rail, and truck under the Carter administration, and is a great thought model for, for this agency. These items are purchased to use, and their markets are naturally well-behaved, efficient, and serve their users. The first policy rule, rule is to leave these markets be. A asset markets are a problem because they have value in use and value in exchange. And these values can become disconnected, sometimes for long periods. This is what happened to housing mortgage markets from 1922 to 1929, leading to a price collapse against fixed mortgage debt from 1929 to 1934, with fallout continuing until 1940, when national household balance sheet equity was finally restored to its 1929 level. That was 11 years okay, in which household equity nationally was depressed below the 29 level. This scenario was repeated from 1997 to 2007, leading to the collapse in 2007 and nine, the continued fallout from weak balance sheet equity, eventually leading to the creation of the CFPB, and it's why we're all here today. When use value disconnects from exchange value, prices become subject to rational, trend-based, or momentum trading. Disconnected from rationality based on expected fundamental use value. Rational expectations are not wrong, but they are simply trumped by trend following. Notice that entry competition into this momentum market exacerbates the disconnect, as does the inflow of mortgage funds. Proposals to limit the inflow of mortgage funds are, are opposed by all incumbent homeowners, like a skunk at a garden party. Houses last for 100 years or thereabouts and are bought mostly with other people's money. Always a disaster, eager and ready to happen. Severe recessions like the Depression and Great Recession are balance uh, sheet recessions because most people's wealth is in their homes. Securities market price collapses yield far less fallout, 
partly because they are less widely held, but much more importantly because margin loan purchases of securities are against call loan debt. If prices fall, margin calls prevent equity from declining and going negative, as with house mortgage debt. This was not, for example, understood by the Fed in the spring of 2005, when, realizing we were in a housing bubble, thought the fallout would be modest because only modest fallout, uh, fallout occurred following the dot-com crash. But that's an irrelevant comparison. In summary, the policy challenge is to moderate or prevent use and resale value from becoming un uncoupled. This requires attention to the topic of incentive compatibility, and I want to address that later in the question period. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon. Uh, next up is uh, Mursa, Professor Mursa Baradarin. Professor Baradarin, the floor is yours. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having me uh, on this really important um, uh, panel for this task force. Um, I want to talk about um, inclusion and access in my remarks. So I'm going to focus on a micro uh, story to, to, to give some, some uh, context for the macro problems that, that I think I see. Um, so uh, for weeks uh, and months, actually hundreds of people have been waiting in a, an, for hours in a single file line for the one ATM at a New York City branch of KeyBank, which is the only bank branch offering unemployment benefits without fees. The Times reported that every day from dawn till dusk, uh, since the beginning of this crisis, there's been a long um, line. And the Post reports that the crowd made up mostly of people of color who have come from the five boroughs and who amidst the pandemic, this is their quote, um, rolled the dice on their health just to avoid getting gouged with surcharge, surcharges at out-of-network banks. Um, they, the, the Times profiled one um, gentleman, Mr. Kwan, who came from Queens to save the $3 of over uh, a fee that he, uh, his own bank was going to charge in Queens. Um, and then these are the people who actually got the unemployment benefits. Other reports already abound of long lines waiting to submit unemployment claims and even longer to have them approved. Uh, once approved, roughly 70 million Americans will have to wait at least a month to get their benefits. Um, as to direct payments, reports indicate um, glitches in the IRS system resulting in payments going to incorrect bank accounts. And for those who finance, finance their tax uh, return preparation through refund anticipation checks, the payment will be routed to a temporary bank account that individuals may not know um, that it exists. For those without a bank account, the wait may be um, as extreme as about five um, months, and that's according to uh, Brookings' report. Uh, the massive scale of this crisis will mix with the financial precarity of many Americans and will likely lead them to the open arms of payday lenders, title lenders, pawn shops, and high interest lenders, uh, because these interest lenders always fill the void where the banking sector um, uh, fails to do so. Uh, you know, as, as you, you know from a report that, that the CFPB has produced, uh, there are you know, 12 million Americans check out payday loans each year, spending about $9 billion in fees alone. Um, the average size of a loan is only about $375, with an added interest payment of up to $520. And typically, these uh, uh, loans are rolled over, um, and, and borrowers tend to borrow again and again. Uh, so uh, these problems are not new. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, many of us have been studying this uh, for years. Um, and, and yet, this, this uh, crisis really highlights um, the precarity of certain communities, specifically uh, black and brown communities, low-income communities, rural communities. And believe it or not, from the time I started studying this, around the 2010s, these problems have gotten a lot worse. Um, over the last 10 years, as bank mergers have sped up, over 93% of bank closures were in LMI communities. Um, rural America has lost over half of its banks. And the second banks leave, um, the higher cost um, both lenders and financial transaction providers end up filling the void, which means that uh, unbanked individuals um, end up spending about 10% of their income, up to 10% of their income on just financial um, transactions. There's reports of people having to drive 40 miles for uh, an ATM that charges, you know, $5, $6 um, per transaction. Um, and uh, so 
So this is, you know, the unbanked are, um, and underbanked represent a, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the population, depending on um, what kind of um, services they use. And this is a lot, not just money, but time, stress. And now we're talking about exposure to a virus um, because of the, um, the lack of digital access to payments. Um, and so uh, the, the simple problem, as I see it, is that the U.S. banking system is only available um, to banks and their customers, which uh, makes sense. But the banks don't have a mandate to serve every community. And that competition has heightened over the last um, 10 years, certainly over the last several decades. Um, banks have simply shut down their lower profit branches. And that has hit uh, low-income communities especially hard. So if you're outside of the banking system, you have to pay a toll to use it. So whether that's for small credit, and that's a separate problem, which uh, we can talk about maybe later, but there's also just a simple access to the payment system, which ends up being um, uh, free for those of us within the banking system and costly for those of us outside. So this is, I think, squarely in the mission of all the bank regulators and then also um, the CFPB because it regulates so close to uh, the consumer uh, in its in its mission um, and and you know to to uh, some of the solutions that have been offered are digital banking mobile banking you know fintech which I think are essential services and will certainly um, fill uh, uh, the need. Um, but to truly reach the unbanked and underbanked, um, you need a physical location, the ability to deposit your cash wages or take out um, cash to pay for goods. And, and until you have that digital account, you're going to rely on these high-cost ATMs or check cashers. Um, and this is because uh, 20 to 40 million Americans don't have broadband Internet access services. Many Americans don't have mobile devices or computers, including elderly Americans who are um, most in need of, of these uh, funds, um, especially right now. Um, most LMI communities still operate at least some portion of their financial activities in cash. They receive wages in cash or have to use cash to buy groceries, uh, fruit, babysitters, rent, all of that stuff. Um, uh, research shows that the vast majority of Americans with an income of less than $50,000 $50, or less prefer a simple debit card for their financial transactions. So for us to be able to meet the needs of where, um, to where the consumers are, uh, instead of you know, focusing on fintech, we should just focus on opening up the tracks that are already laid for um, the rest of us. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas that I've promoted uh, and, and a policy solution that I think could work is just opening up the payment system that is already there and allowing a physical branch. So I've suggested uh, the post office as, as a possibility. There could be others. But the idea would be to, to have a simple um, checking account. And, and you know, uh, there's to close, I guess, with another story, um, uh, the American banker uh, journalist Kevin Wack uh, reported that he uh, went to a town in Duncan, Arizona that lost their only bank. And um, when they lost their bank, business revenues shrank. Um, when a small town loses a bank, uh, the, uh, the University of Delaware um, estimates that they, the town loses about 20% of their business income. And uh, when he went to the town, uh, the, the hotel owner said uh, that she walks over to the post office, buys a single stamp, and requests a check back, which is cheaper than patronizing either of the town's two uh, per-charge ATMs. And, uh, you know, he talked to many people, and including the post office, saying that they were using the post office already as a bank. So, you know, people are innovative and inventive, and they will find the resources at hand um, to, you know, do their financial transactions. So, so far, that's what um, the post office uh, has done. But, but to kind of go back to first principles, uh, the, the Fed payment system, the um, banking system is uh, federally supported, um, both through FDIC insurance, through uh, the Fed's mandate to serve the public, uh, and the fact that uh, many people are left out, and they're left out because either their income or the place that they live uh, is, quite frankly, undemocratic. And so that's um, a, a problem that I believe that this um, agency could, could fix. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Baradarum, for those, uh, for those, for those, those comments. Um, next up, we have uh, Professor Bogan. Uh, Professor Bogan, we look forward to hearing your uh, comments. The floor is yours. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I was, I was excited to learn about the CFPB Task Force and its mission, and so I just wanted to thank you for allowing me to participate in the process. Um, the Task Force mission, as I understand it, is to develop recommendations for ways to improve and strengthen consumer financial laws and regulations. And I believe this mission is critical for facilitating <coughs> economic mobility. I'm a finance professor, so I think about the potential determinants of economic mobility in terms of different forms of capital. I think the three most 
important types of capital in this regard are social capital, human capital, and financial capital. My academic research primarily focuses on how people make decisions regarding financial capital. I also investigate how human capital helps enable or hinder the acquisition of financial capital. Things like how are um, health and education related to wealth building and inequality. We know research tells us that it's important for households to have access to financial markets. Participating in financial markets is a key to wealth building, and I strongly believe this, but there need to be safeguards. I believe the CFPB can do a great deal to protect consumers who engage financial markets for the purpose of facilitating the acquisition of financial capital. One express area for focus is regulation with regard to how consumers can access financial markets. When we think over the past two decades, we have seen that the manner and frequency with which individuals engage and participate in financial markets has been evolving. From being able to um, participate by stocks or equities only through stock brokers, to being able to invest and participate in stock markets through internet trading, now to being able to trade on your smartphone using an app, we've seen this sort of historic transformation in how consumers access financial markets. And under this backdrop, I believe there is a significant opportunity for more consumer protection policies governing these investing apps, uh, the firms that manage investing apps, and the new financial um, institutions that are beginning to shape the way consumers interact and engage in financial markets. These types of firms are growing and are going to be an increasingly larger segment of the market. And so as a result, I feel that we need enhanced consumer protections in this area. And I'll elaborate more on the specific recommendations that I have in the question and answer period, but I'll just leave it here um, to say that I think as we see more FinTech and more ways that consumers are engaging with financial markets, we need to clearly focus on how we enhance consumer protections in this area. Thank you. Thank you for uh, Professor Bogan, and um, that in cleanup is um, uh, Dean Marcus Cole from uh, from Notre Dame. Uh, Professor uh, Dean Cole, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Dean, uh, Director Craniger and Assistant Director Cameron, um, for allowing me to participate in this really important discussion. The problem with going last on a panel like this is that everything good has already been said. So I'm hoping that I can add something, and I think I have something to add. Um, in the past, several commentators, including Howard Beals, have suggested that within the American economy, consumers are protected by each of the three legs of a three-legged stool, namely market competition, the common law institutions of contract, tort, and property, and finally, consumer protection law. What I'd like to add and what I'd like to suggest is that this historical and helpful view is incomplete. There's actually a fourth leg creating not a stool, but an incredibly stable four-legged table. And that fourth leg is jurisdictional competition between regulators. While jurisdictional competition has been a hallmark of American law since its very inception, nowhere has jurisdictional competition been more successful or more threatened than in the realm of financial regulation. To maintain a successful economy, it's critically important that each of these four legs of the table remain in equipoise. If one overwhelms the others, it's likely to tip the careful balance, resulting in an erosion of the American economic miracle. Furthermore, technological advances have actually strengthened each of these four legs. Competitors can quickly see and compare their terms and products with those available to consumers in the marketplace 
and they can, more quickly than ever before, adjust their terms and modify their products to outcompete their competition. And by the same token, in fact, by the very same technology, consumers can more quickly and easily compare products. No expertise, no problem. Technology now makes it possible for even the least sophisticated consumers to access the expertise of world-class experts and intermediaries for virtually every consumer product or service, including financial services, most often for no charge at all. Technology allows consumers to make better decisions than ever before. Technology has also reinforced the second leg, namely the common law institutions of contract, property, and tort. While suppliers of goods and services rely more and more on form contracts to govern their relationships with consumers, abusive terms are quickly spotted by competitors and pointed out in advertising. Consumer bloggers and raiders also hold suppliers of one-sided terms or inferior products up to public ridicule. Technology also allows consumers to easily record and reproduce fraudulent statements or practices made by suppliers chilling bad behavior like never before. When it comes to the third leg, that of consumer protection law, technology reinforces that too. Regulators can now more easily collect data, enforce disclosure requirements, and quickly identify sources of abuse like never before. This very hearing would not have been possible even 10 years ago without enormous expense and effort. The fourth leg that I'm suggesting of this very stable American economic table should not be forgotten or ignored. It is the leg of jurisdictional competition, and it is the defining characteristic of the American economic miracle. No other economy in the world can match the might of the American economy because no other economy in the world can match the, the competitive discipline imposed by American federalism and jurisdictional competition. Jurisdictional competition presents clear advantages in the realm of regulation because regulators don't need to be perfect in order to take action. They can learn both from their own successes and mistakes, but also from the successes and mistakes of other regulators. Several of the greatest regulatory achievements in history have been the product of this pattern of regulatory growth through the continual feedback loop afforded by jurisdictional competition. Nowhere are the benefits of jurisdictional competition and regulatory learning more evident than in the financial sector. With jurisdictional competition between states, jurisdictional competition between the state and the federal government, and in financial markets, the jurisdictional competition does not stop there. Within the federal government, there's jurisdictional competition between financial regulators, such as the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the Treasury Department writ large, and the CFPB. Each of these regulators has a role to play. In summary, I'd like to suggest that it is critical whenever new regulation is considered, the delicate balance or equipoise achieved between the four legs of American consumer protection be kept in mind. Furthermore, regulators are uniquely positioned to engage and employ the other three legs of this delicate balance. Regulators can learn from their mistakes and the mistakes of others but only if they allow for room, uh, room for others. In other words, monopoly in regulation is just as bad, perhaps even worse, than monopoly in the private sector because re regulatory monopolists crowd out regulatory innovation. Thank you. Thank you all for the insightful remarks. I'd like to now ask a few questions, or begin to ask a few questions on some specific topics. We'll have approximately 12 minutes per topic, so we'll open by directing questions to specific panelists and then allow others to join in the conversation. Professor Zwicky will call on the panelists, and members of the task force will chime in to request clarifying statements as needed or to transition to the next topic. First topic on the legal framework of is con the legal framework of consumer protection. Consumer financial protection is promoted by a framework of laws, regulations, decisions, directives, regulatory policies, guidelines, recommendations, and procedures made by numerous state and federal regulatory organizations. Dean Cole, continuing along these lines, 
Are there areas in which existing consumer protection laws are inadequate or need to be strengthened to ensure consumers are adequately protected? Likewise, how can the Bureau use its regulatory tools of rulemaking, enforcement, supervision, and education effectively to maximize consumer welfare? So I think that's a great question, um, but uh, I actually think that um, what uh, needs to happen in the realm of consumer protection, particularly with regard to uh, financial regulation, uh, is the scaling back of, uh, of uh, consumer protection uh, regulation, particularly in the area with regard to uh, small lending uh, and uh, payday lending, uh, and what we are seeing um, uh, more frequently referred to as fringe tech. Uh, fringe tech is um, fintech applied to the fringes of the economy um, uh, for things like small dollar loans, payday loans, uh, and those, uh, those types of um, um, devices that are used to uh, help fund the day-to-day -day activities of low-income Americans. Um, one of the uh, advantages that are being afforded by uh, technology is that technology is reducing the cost of borrowing and of uh, credit. I hate using the term credit, by the way, with respect to payday loans and um, uh, payday advances because it's not truly credit. It's, uh, it's not a loan. It doesn't re really require uh, underwriting the way uh, other loans do. They're, they're really more um, uh, wage advances, um, but nevertheless, um, historically, uh, brick and mortar payday lenders and um, uh, uh, small small dollar loan uh, facilities uh, have required um, extensive um, uh, human capital and extensive labor uh, in order to provide these services. Uh, but fringe tech or financial technology is now reducing, dramatically reducing the cost of this. And one of the things we need to have uh, more thoughtful approaches to are how we scale back uh, uh, regulation that was originally designed to protect consumers where they didn't have access to information, they didn't have access to, to intermediaries, and the costs of accessing these kinds of resources were very high. Uh, now, it, uh, with the reduction in cost and the availability of information, um, those, regulatory, those regulatory barriers may actually impose costs on uh, low-income consumers that uh, are unnecessary and are not helpful and are not protecting them um, uh, uh, from anything other than access uh, to capital. Professor Cole, if I could ask you a follow-up that knits together sure. uh, um, the, the, your, your, your opening statement with that is, do you have any thought, you, you talked about the value of jurisdictional competition, uh, which I understand, um, and you've also talked about the value of FinTech, uh, fringe tech uh, and the like. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the challenges involving federalism and FinTech uh, sort of recognizing the, um, and what you might do about that, sort of recognizing the inherently placeless or at least interstate, if not international, nature of uh, fintech-type uh, fintech products, which many people mm -hmm. see as having a clash with um, uh, traditional federalism in terms of reaching economies of scale, complying with um, multiple different state regulations and the like. Do you have any thoughts on how we might think about reconciling uh, those, uh, those benefits of interjurisdictional competition with the benefits of um, the Internet? Yes, absolutely. Um, you may be familiar with some of my work on um, M-PESA, which is the um, uh, financial technology platform that is used across Africa, and it's also made its way into Southern Asia, uh, as well as things like uh, WeChat Pay and, uh, and Alipay in China. Um, one of the things that those platforms have in common is that they serve poor people without any brick-and-mortar um, uh, access to banks. They are the largest uh, um, uh, movements of capital in the world, uh, and they do it all without brick and mortar uh, banks. Uh, they were a grassroots development from people uh, uh, circumventing um, the difficulties of life in uh, sub Saharan Africa 
by people first uh, using top-up vouchers to move money around uh, to convert into cash, uh, to the cell phone companies recognizing that this was a mechanism for um, uh, banking at, uh, by the low-income uh, population of Africa. If this had been regulated at the outset, poor people in Africa would not have had access uh, to money. Um, and today, uh, the governments in Africa recognize uh, that this is a, an incredible uh, support to their economy. Some studies have shown that anywhere from 10 to 15 percent increases in G, uh, GDP for uh, sub-Saharan Africa are directly uh, tied to mobile money transfer platforms. The same thing could be true in the United States if we give it a chance. Uh, in other words, it would suggest that a state-by-state -state regulatory approach to FinTech or what's called fringe tech, and I obviously don't like that, that term, but what's called fringe tech, if it's regulated on a state-by-state -state basis, we can actually learn what are the most effective ways of promoting money to low-income people rather than taking a uh, top-down approach uh, from the, uh, from federal re regulators that impose the solution that may or may not be optimal. And there's no way to find out if it's optimal without the experimentation of the states. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists have uh, many questions for, uh, for Dean Cole? Um, Okay. Well, we could uh, come back to that. Uh, come back to that later. Um, uh, why don't we turn, move on to our next uh, uh, witness then? And I believe Howard uh, Beals will be uh, um, coming up on this. Uh, yeah, I guess it's I guess it's time to continue the conversation to uh, to talk about consumer information and ed education. Um, financial mobility and empowerment are enhanced by increases in formal education, uh, by increases in financial ed education, and by giving consumers more choices. That's especially true with vulnerable and protected populations. Uh, Professor Bogan, what actions can the federal government take uh, to enhance financial mobility? Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in the relationship to information. Do you think that providing information for consumers uh, is uh, in the form of disclosures and the like is adequate for protecting consumers? Uh, and how do you think disclosures should be updated uh, for the electronic age? So, thank you for this question. So let me start with a, a, a little anecdote um, that kind of frames my comments today. So there have been several articles in the popular press, the New York Times, Forbes, over the past few weeks in June and July, talking about what's been coined the gamification of investing. And these articles report consumers with lim little education and or scant information trading quite exotic financial securities, things like put options and call options, things that are, are much more sophisticated than just taking um, buying stocks and taking long equity positions. And they're actually trading these securities in a way that they would on a gambling app or a gambling website. And what's been reported is that these individuals are losing a great deal of money. One of the more disturbing aspects of some of these articles was reported that a 20-year-old college student died by suicide after seeing a negative balance of almost three quarters of a million dollars on one of these investment apps. So beyond losing money these secure, uh, on these apps, consumers um, are doing more than just losing money. Someone actually lost their life. And to me, these stories highlight the need for increased regulation and oversight of these specific new types of firms and financial institutions and fintech firms. Um, and as a result of that, I would recommend that you consider some of the following. It is absolutely critical that we provide better information and more disclosure to consumers with regard to these new investing apps and new ways to access financial markets. And correspondingly, 
we need to provide better information and better um, accountability with regard to managing these accounts and the account status. And I, you know, I don't think many people are privy to the details of the, the case where the person lost their life earlier, but it was indicated that the account balance, you know, they cleared one half of the trade but not the other, and he saw this, you know, almost three quarters of a million dollars in a negative balance, and it was so stressful that that's what prompted him to take his life per his suicide note. And so this highlights the need to provide um, better information and to mandate better information and better managing of these types of accounts. We need to provide more information to consumers about potential risk. These apps cannot be managed and presented like a gambling app or a gambling website, and it's clear that they are. Currently, these apps have a number of elements that belie the significance of the risks that are being taken by the consumers. Just to give you an example, every time you make a trade, good or bad, the app shows confetti you know, blowing up and congratulations on trading. And all of these nudges and uh, interaction with the, the app is just designed to encourage consumers to trade because these institutions, as part of their business model, they make more money the more trades are being done. And so this screams for an opportunity to protect consumers in terms of how they're accessing these financial markets. I think we need to think about requiring disclosures to be updated immediately on these apps. Uh, moreover, these disclosures should be written in easy to understand language with key points highlighted, not sort of the long endless scroll and small font that you often see when you, you know, must accept new terms for various uh, services or subscriptions. Um, another thing that I would recommend for consideration is that we think about regulating and limiting access to younger consumers. I'll repeat again that the person who died by suicide was only 20 years old. He could not legally buy alcohol in the United States, but he could amass an almost three quarters of a million dollar negative balance. And so we need to think about who has access, how the information is presented, and how that's regulated. In a nutshell, I think we need to consider something similar to what was done with the 2009 Credit Card Act. You know, there was a section in that act about prompt and fair crediting of payment. Um, correspondingly, when we think about managing these investment apps, we need better information on account status. Um, in the Credit Card Act, there was information about enhanced consumer disclosures. We're going to need clear disclosures and clear information about the risks. Uh, I'll repeat again, when we think about um, these investment apps, they're allowing consumers to have access to specific types of exotic financial securities like options, you know, buying and selling put options, which is not a non-trivial, quite complicated type of financial asset. And so we need to highlight what the potential risks of investing in these assets could pose to the consumers. We also need to think about, um, similar to with the Credit Card Act, there was, a, uh, there was a title for protection of young consumers. So specifically, we need to think about regulating and limiting access to young people. We do it in other contexts. You know, if, you, you know, if you're 20 years old, you can't buy alcohol. You can't rent a car. Um, there are uh, safeguards to protect uh, consumers in this regard. And I think as more people have access to financial markets, we need to think about similar types of safeguards. I do could, want to be could, clear could, could, that could I, I – yes, could, yes sir. Could, could I just ask, I, um, d tell me what's unique about access through apps. Um, there's, I mean, the, the finance professor's advice has always been diversify, buy and hold, 
none of this day trading nonsense. You're just going to lose money in that because there's people who are better informed in the marketplace. Nonetheless, there's always been people who have done that through their brokers uh, in all sorts of financial assets. It's cheaper now, but what else is different uh, other than it's cheaper? That's an excellent question. So it being cheaper now, I think, great thing. Limiting transaction costs, making it easier um, to engage in these markets, I think is a good thing. But the way some of these apps are structured, um, I don't know, a lot of people have heard of the popular press about nudges and people using um, principles of behavioral economics to get people to make certain kinds of choices. And within the context of these apps, there are a lot of behavioral nudges that try to encourage people to trade. And this is not, these aren't nudges that are coming in the context of, as you mentioned before, before you went to your broker. Uh, and implicit in your interaction with the broker is, you know, education and somebody um, giving you information, and you're not sitting on your phone, you know, in your basement um, making trades, being um, subtly nudged to just trade more, even if it's not in your best interest to do so. And so the thing about these apps, I mean, it's good and bad. It's good in that transaction costs are being lower, and so people have more access. It is bad if the, uh, they're not regulated such that consumers are protected from being encouraged to make financial choices that are not in their best interest, but are in the best interest of the firm. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. I have a comment. Vernon here. Uh, what Sorry, I, is interesting about this to me is that none of this is in traditional portfolio theory. Traditional theory and economics says you make you look at the assets, you look at your your the expected return and volatility. Uh, you make your investment and you hold it until the information changes. But what we have out there is a world in which the information is changing every minute, okay? And we have everybody involved, very large numbers of people involved in momentum trading, trend chasing, and and all this sort of thing. Uh, and and what's interesting, you see, is that none of that is part of <clears throat> what we traditionally recommend to people, but nobody pays any attention to it. <laughs> Professor Pokin, if I could um, ask you a question since you raised the issue of young people, which I think is a, a, a fascinating issue. We know the young people, um, that, that there's um, that student loans are a huge, um, a huge issue. Um, huge amounts of student loan debt um, taken on with no underwriting um, whatsoever um, and, and very long-lasting sorts of things. Um, and, uh, um, and we know that's had impact on household formation, macroeconomic uh, things and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I want to ask two, two questions related to your comments, which is you gave the example of credit card, um, uh, credit, credit card act, and you've given this example about the, uh, the apps, and I understand your point, but um, but uh, um, and, and maybe it's just a disclosure issue, which I'd like you to uh, um, elaborate on more. Your your belief that disclosure is enough, but one of the things that um, I've observed and I wonder about is it appears that young people today may be kind of maturing, uh, financially maturing later in life, and par partly that's because of student loan debt. But but to what extent? It seems like there's potentially a trade-off here between giving um, young people too much access to financial services and, and products, whether it's credit cards or you know, investments, right? I have no idea, honestly. I literally don't have any idea how that kid, I know the example you're talking about, got access to so much uh, um, uh, stuff. But, um, but it seems like in one sense there's a benefit to giving access to, uh, to younger people. Everybody knows the example of the parents who gave them the credit card when they went to college and, 
with a limited credit line, that sort of thing, while at the same time getting it over their head. And uh, how, do we, how do you navigate that? And the second thing is, do we know to what extent some of the student loan debt uh, that we're seeing may be young people who are in college who maybe can't get access to credit cards now or um, I have trouble getting access to other uh, uh, bank accounts because of regulation or, or what other problem. But the more general question is how do we, how do we get people to mature financially um, without, um, if, without giving them access to the products that they would use to, uh, to, to, to learn? Um, well, there's a lot in your question, so let me see right. if I can try to unpack it. Um, let me start with the most recent thing you said first. I mean, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right that younger people are financially maturing later in life. And I think there's not just one reason for that, but I actually have some research with a grad student. We called it um, the boomerang generation. We called it boomerang bias because, because of the student loan uh, people are going back to live with their parents. And as a result of living in a household with their parents, they're often, we found in, in our research, they're less likely to um, hold stocks and um, do other types of more mature financial behaviors. And so we're balancing that. Again, something that you mentioned before, um, young people are actually more likely to engage in financial markets through technology. And so when you think about uh, the apps that I've been referencing, they're more likely to trade stocks or engage on their smartphone or their laptop um, than older generations. And so I think it's a very multifaceted problem. Um, just to be clear, I think that giving people access is important. Giving people access to financial markets is important. But I do think there have to be checks and balances. And so I'm not a huge proponent of limiting access, but I think the access that is given needs to be regulated and policies do need to be in place to put a kind of floor on how much potential damage could be done. I mean, when we think about, and this goes back um, uh, to um, uh, the earlier comment about um, there should be, you know, we've been counseled financial theory in the case that we should have a buy and hold strategy. And the only time you really should be manipulating or turning your portfolio is when the information changes. Um, but through some of these apps and the particular case that I referenced, um, the the 20 year old that committed suicide, he was trading put options, and he was doing a very complicated sort of put spread, which is not a um, you know wealth building buy and hold type of strategy. It's something that sophisticated financial traders do, and so there has to be coupled with. Um, you know, access, there have to be protections in place. Uh, and also, uh, I know um, Mr. Beals mentioned education. We have to think <clears throat> critically about how we're going to educate people with regard to financial markets and their participation in the financial market. I think when we think about um, wealth building and trying to facilitate economic mobility, access to financial markets is important. Um, but on the flip side, along with this access, we need enhanced consumer protection policies in terms of how they can access it and what kind of safeguards are put in place. Um, and both in the way um, in regulating the apps and how they're maintained and also the firms that are managing the apps. Well, Professor Baradarian, did you want to weigh in here? Um, yes. Uh, you know, I want to uh, defend uh, the young, uh, the millennials here uh, for a second because I do think, you know, uh, the research is just that, you know, they have more debt than any other generation before them. And part of that is because uh, of the structure of the education system. College is 
way more expensive than it was. College is now way more necessary than it was. And so they're um, burdened with debt, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've you know, now expo been exposed to two crises back-to-back. Um, and so, you know, on education and on maturity, I tend to think when a lot of people are making the same decisions, instead of people like us who are uh, more privileged, I, I, you know, graduated college in the 90s, so I do not experience um, what these um, students do, who are my students. I've been teaching them for 10 years. And from where I sit as a professor, it's not that they are irresponsible or immature or um, financially, uh, um, you know, uh, lagged behind. They are under a lot more pressure than I ever was. And so in a way, they're under more. They know more about um, interest rates on their loans and, and where to get uh, the best deals than, than before. So if not, I, I actually think information for some of them. I think on this trading thing that um, – Ms. Bogan is talking about, that is a truly uh, a worrisome trend. Um, uh, you know, and then go broadly on the idea of financial education, I think, you know, with the story, the reason I shared that story, um, you know, that you have uh, uh, someone biking in from Queens to save $3, uh, that, I mean, that's a person who's very financially savvy. He just needs $3 because that could mean a meal or not. So for a lot of people who live on margins, who take out payday loans or who um, don't have access to bank accounts, they're making a rational choice. It's not anything that education um, can fix because there aren't other options. If you live in a banking desert, if you don't have enough money to avoid the overdraft fees on your bank account, if you're young and don't have the money to pay for college outright, you're going to take out loans, you're going to take out payday loans, you're going to go you know, into the bank and wait hours and hours in line. So I tend to see these things as uh, problems of systems, and I, I, I tend to think quite honestly sometimes it's a cop-out to say, oh, let's educate each individual instead of changing the system that they're part of. So banks are charging fees. They're charging overdraft fees. So if you don't have enough money uh, to, to put in a bank account, sometimes you can get pegged for these fees, and that's a big revenue stream for people. So people rationally decide not to do that. Uh, same with the, the young uh, folks doing this. And, uh, you know, I, I think, yes, some people are going to be um, frivolous with their money and reckless, you know, um, of course, but that's up and down the wealth scale. I think it would, be, uh, it would behoove us to actually just focus on making their decisions, their, their bad decisions, not so financially catastrophic. Thanks. Uh, I, I will say if they know enough to trade put spreads, they know more than I do. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, I have a question. How about <clears throat> should we, should there be consideration given given to licensing access? You can't drive an automobile without a license. To get a license, you require requires dr some driver training, and you have to have proof of competence. And then you can get in an automobile and drive it. But you have all of these apps out there that you're telling me about that are kind of little weapons of mass destruction, and people freely uh, access them. Uh, <clears throat> like a test of competency, basically. Like you would have to. Yeah. Oh, you, you can do it when you prove that you can that you're competent, and and there's some sort of procedure for for determining that. I mean. How does this well, differ a, from, from an automobile license? That's an interesting idea because I was sitting here wondering what kind of disclosure you could give a person who thought that um, trading put spreads in response to the gratification of getting confetti on his screen was, was a rational idea. Um, I mean, I once had a young friend who thought that – who had no money, and he thought that um, trading in Bitcoin was m going to be much more remunerative for him than having any sort of regular day job. Um, that didn't actually work out so well for him. Uh, but, but when you have people who are so responsive – to these gimmicks, um, you know, I'm as a as a longtime consumer protection lawyer. I'm trying to think of how I would write a law that says no gimmicks, or how I would write a disclosure that would make a bit of difference to the person that I was trying to reach. Disclosure that was uh, um, 
could inform somebody who already knows what a put spread is, but that apparently doesn't know the dangers. Uh, um, it's a challenge. Let's um, let's move on uh, from there. Thank you for that. I would ask also um, uh, all the panelists and uh, all the all the members of the task force and um, everybody else, please check to make sure your phones are off and your computer sound is off. Um, somebody is. Uh, we're getting a pinging from somebody. Uh, um, uh, so thank you. Um, and with that, we'll move on to uh, to, to Bill McLeod. Uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Todd. My favorite subject is competition, which I think is an important aspect of consumer protection. And I'd like to frame my question in two ways. Uh, we all know that competition means consumers have choices among a lot of providers, and that prevents the providers from exercising market power over the consumers. If there are areas where that is not the case, I'd like to learn about that. And also, I'd like to learn about barriers that our panelists have seen to the entry or expansion of firms in markets that look like they need a little more competition. And maybe we can start it off with Professor Smith. Is there any thought you have on that general subject on either side of it? The uh the thing that I, I think that it is important for a bureau like this to be involved in thinking about is what in economics we like to call incentive compatibility. The whole idea that the incentives of individuals have to be compatible with whatever the wealth creating social or economic objectives of the, of markets or whatever the institution is. And the reason why I started out in my opening remarks talking about non-durable goods is that, that that very large category of goods does really well. Okay? It's uh you see, that's a world which is governed by laws requiring sellers to deliver, buyers to pay, and supplemented by truth in labeling and advertising. Those are more recent, you know, the last hundred years or so that we've had that. And those markets are basically work quite well on their own. It's in this it's in this stuff that, that gets retraded. And uh you see, we've seen in housing asset market supply chain was shot through with incentive compatibilities from, from 1997 to 2008. Recall that in 1997, we had an enormously popular bipartisan bill to exempt primary home ownership from capital gains taxes up to $1.5 million dollars. Now, although that is a defensible, wealth-growing idea for all capital investments, it was an incredibly bad idea to select one asset and sweeten it in this way. You expect investment funds to be diverted and to flow into that asset. You see, and that's exactly what happened. We met the enemy, and he was us. Uh, as a, as a consequence, house prices surged. They surged to new inflation-adjusted highs by from by 2001. Now, 2000. Well, this is well before all of the many incentive new incentive in, uh, the all the inventive new incentive compatible uh, forms of financial innovation had set in and that widened this gap between values and, and prices. Uh, and I think similar proposals are likely to be coming in the future, and it, I think it's important that for, this, for the Bureau to be willing to stand in the wind to identify these, these dangers. <clears throat> uh, in, in some ways, I think it's the most kind of unique and important function that the, 
that the Bureau could engage in. Now, let me give you some, uh, some very specific examples. And this is, this is coming out of the housing mortgage market uh, crisis. Uh, now, consider mortgage loan originations, which were a major source of poor quality mortgages sold to banks then pooled into diversified portfolios insured by, list, by unlisted derivatives issued on them and then sold to investors. Well, why were these loans such poor quality? Very simply, a lump sum upfront fee was paid the originator who holds the loan only long enough to sell. And this, of course, is why that the, when the housing mortgage markets went south, you had Countrywide and IndyMac, they were specialists in loan originations. They were among the first bankruptcy in this chain, in the chain of collapse. The incentive of, incentive of the loan originator was uncoupled with the incentive of a lender. Now, how, how might you fix that? Well... Uh, so that the loan originator is free to do their specialty and produce mortgages like those that any prudent uh, lender might issue. Well, here would be a proposal for study and testing. Very simply, whatever the market determined fee, let, let it be paid to the originator in proportion to the principal payment spread over the life of the loan. Hence, if you write a 10-year interest-only loan, then you get no fee payment for 10 years. Your incentive is to write lender-friendly, not hostile loans. It, of course, needs testing. I'm not proposing that one just do that without a little more study because there's unintended consequences, of course, lurk uh, in the best laid plans uh, for rulemaking. And another example is mortgage service providers. If a mortgage is in default, does the provider have incentives to work out a refinancing program to keep the homeowner in the house? Or does the provider collect more money from foreclosure than finding a means to avoid it? It's far less costly to, for society if you can work out a means to keep the homeowner in the house and, and, and make these payments uh, manage. Dr. Smith, could I... Wanna, go, hello? Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I thought you were done. Well, I just want to mention one more thing, and that is that to the extent that hedge funds or other specialists in momentum, momentum trading are privileged with tax incentives, the problem of asset instability is greatly exacerbated. Now, if that situation is not your problem, whose is it? Because to the extent that they have passed through uh, tax status, and as far as I'm concerned, all businesses should have that, but you choose some and you sweeten that, and, and, and I can tell you, you can expect trouble out of that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, if I could ask you, since uh, we have here, do you have any general thoughts based on your um, experience with experimental in, uh, um, economics about the, just the general open-ended question about um, uh, behavioral economics and the role of behavioral economics in uh, consumer, uh, in, in thinking about consumer protection generally, consumer financial protection specifically, and making specific well, um, recommendations about regulations and the like? You know, there's been a lot of talk about trying to help consumers make better decisions to kind of protect them from themselves. Uh, I prefer to emphasize uh, the, the, the development of... I, I'd like to have consumers able to make their own judgments and be able and find means 
you see of protecting themselves because you're always going to, if you're all if you're always going to look and look for ways to protect consumers uh from themselves from the mistakes they might make you see you, you you're really not you're not really not addressing the problem which has to be come in the form of better informed and and consumers who are better able to make decisions okay and and i think that at least some part of the Bureau's activities should be directed to that rather than sort of fixed ups given, uh, given the situations and the things that people are doing out there. Thank you. Why don't we, um, let's move on to, um, to, uh, to my question. Uh, and um, we're going to talk to about inclusion and access, which I'm sure many of you will have um, uh, will be feed our way in on, but I'd like to first address it, Professor Bar uh, Bar and This is obviously something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts uh, and um, in, in mind. Uh, Professor Bar Darren, obviously you've written a lot on this topic and you address this in your opening statements in a very uh, powerful way. Um, I would ask you first if you just want to to elaborate, but you raised two two things that I'd also, if you would be willing to talk about, um, which is. Um, the first is you mentioned, um, and this is something that's intrigued me, um, a lot of consumers just want simple debit cards or simple checking account. And one of the things that, uh, that I've been thinking about that we've been talking about in task force is we tend to think of financial inclusion as sort of a binary thing now, right? It's either you have a bank account, you don't have a bank account. You either use uh, alternative uh, products or you don't use them, right? Where that, that, that which doesn't uh, it, it does at first glance it doesn't appear to be a very useful way to think about this as opposed to a continuum uh, type of thing and um, and I'd like you if you would just elaborate on what you mean by simple debit cards and checking accounts because it seems like there's a huge middle ground between being unbanked and all the bells and whistles of a uh, of, of a bank account that it's not clear that everybody needs all that to be financially competent and the second thing I would ask you to to, to um, talk about would be um, any, you know, any, uh, what are the primary barriers to in inclusion, what public policies might uh, do them. Uh, you mentioned postal banking, but what do you think about other sort of non, you know, traditional non-banks uh, such as Walmart or Amazon or, I didn't mean to name any particular companies, but, uh, uh, but, but other companies, uh, you know, that have a lot of access to consumers but have not traditionally been, been banks. If you, it's a very vague and open-ended question. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how, what we can do to promote better uh, inclusion uh, and access for consumers. Sure. Yeah, thanks for that question, actually, because it's an important one. Um, I think typically, I mean, historically, you can't understand why we have the banking system we do without understanding the long sort of history of how we got here, right? And as, as you know, I, I know that you know, but, um, you know, we, we bundled the two different services that banks have provided as of ages ago, which is just financial transactional services, right? So anything that is sending and getting money, so it used to be, right, you had to have, a, you know, a bank drive to the clearinghouse and exchange checks and make sure that they weren't fraudulent and we had all this, this money counterfeiters. And so we had this, 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 uh, uh, these tracks for clearing that we only allow banks to operate on because uh, that's just how we've done it historically. And even if you have a fintech app like a Venmo or, you know, mobile app or any bank, any app, you have to, that app ends up using a bank on the back end to do that payment system. So that's, that's one. It's, yes, absolutely. I think a lot of low-income folks don't actually have a need for uh, bells and whistles banking, as you would call it. It, it. They just need access to these um, this transactional account. So that would usually come through the payment system. It could be through ACH, so Visa debit cards, any of that stuff. And, and those are, I mean, a lot of that is uh, regional. So while some of us are digital, we exist on the cloud, all of our finances, a lot of Americans don't. A lot of Americans still exist in the geography, in a community uh, where they spend their money. And so when those communities lose access to these financial services, that, that is a huge barrier for them to get digitally. So that's one, the payment system. And that's why I think, yes, a simple debit card, pick an institution where it would just go through in a simple, safe way. And, and the safety and the technology, that's already there. We don't need to wait for some entrepreneur to create uh, that, a debit card, right? We already have that, and it works just fine for the people that, that need to work, uh, use them. And as far as the other banking services, uh, you know, if you're operating, if I'm a, a banker, 
Uh, I would rather not have, you know, a $500 deposit or $1,000 bank account because I lose money. I'm still operating the services. I'm, I'm paying my staff. I have a location and all that overhead. And so the way that banks make money is that they make big loans um, to big businesses. Uh, they do uh, mortgages and all of that stuff. So those are two different functions of banks. And increasingly, they've gone um, uh, to be vastly different profit centers. So for the transactional accounts, it's more the fintech firms that are kind of making a, a system through a network on, on that side. And then banks are focusing increasingly on their higher profit um, services. Now, the problem with this is not a problem of, of the banks or the, of, of the fintech firms. It's the people who aren't a natural fit for either of those um, two different sectors, and those are the folks who are unbanked and underbanked. And so that, that is a problem uh, because it can, it's not a market problem, right? For me, it is uh, about a public um, utility, which is the payment sector, that's only open to a chartered bank. Um, so one option could be, you know, Walmart, Amazon. Um, the, the thing to worry about, though, with Walmart and Amazon is Amazon still relies on, uh, you know, the USPS and other services to get to that last um, delivery on these areas where um, they're excluded from banking anyway. So a lot of these companies aren't, it's not going to be a profit center. Well, you know, Walmart, I think, on the other hand, could offer checks and things like that. But the bankers, you know, uh, kind of shut down that Walmart application a, a while back just through uh, random politics. So, I, you know, I, I think there are easy solutions um, and there are uh, some market solutions here. But uh, I, I tend to, to think that if, if banks are being supported anyway, um, on their payments processing, we might as well just open that up to everybody. Interesting. So it's uh, um, so so the, the key, as you see it, is unhooking um, the the transactional payment uh, thing that, that sort of everybody needs from the other stuff that uh, that only some people need. Very, very yeah, and then yeah, and then deposit insurance, right, would go toward depositors and wouldn't subsidize all the rest of the banking activities that um, are highly risky. So, um, and so in terms of uh, uh, would you recommend that the, uh, the payment system be opened up to non-banks then? Uh, it depends on the non-bank. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> with, certain, uh, with certain protections. All right. Right. Yeah. So the reason why it's only open to banks is the banks have to, you know, uh, comply with the AML, the Anti-Money Laundering, the Bank Secrecy Act, the KYA, Know Your right. Customer. A lot of this stuff is anti-terrorism. It's anti-money laundering. So there's a whole system of regulation. You may say it's too much, but Congress passed it for some purpose that they have. So, you know, there, there has to be um, some oversight if we're going to keep those intact. Otherwise, you have some people evading it and others not, and, the, right. you know, it's going to be unfair. Do you or any other panelists have any thoughts on uh, the impact of AML laws on financial um, inclusion and the, and the costs associated with that? Uh, I mean, my, my opinion is it has certainly presented uh, massive barriers uh, for some folks, uh, you know, on the identification laws, on, um, you know, uh, so, so there are some barriers, um, you know, as far as the trade-offs, I would need to see more data whether it actually has solved um, some of this crime. But I know, you know, uh, Bitcoin is, is, a, is an option for a lot of that, that AML type things that we worry about. Um, and yet the FBI and other, you know, if you're actually looking for, for those transfers, you can find them. So, so perhaps technologically we're beyond the AML. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I couldn't say that confidently, but um, it, it has been a burden, certainly. Uh, I'll just ask the panel in general. I know this is all of you have done some work on this issue of um, of uh, um, financial inclusion, um, and I'll just invite anybody to weigh in. Um, and one other question, perhaps this is for uh, uh, Professor Smith or Professor Bogan specifically. One of the challenges with financial inclusion, and since Prof uh, Dr. Smith was talking about mortgages, is there's sort of a type one, type two type issue here, right? Which is, type, you know, we want to Make sure that everybody get you know all credit worthy people get access to uh, to, the, the, to, to the credit that they need, but uh, but we also don't want to you know extend or, or you know have too much credit for too many bad risks, uh, right? Um, and if uh, um, and so we, you know so financial inclusion is is good unless it's too much uh, in some sense, but. But, uh, but more generally, do, does anybody else have any thoughts on questions on barriers to inclusion, things that could be done 
to uh, promote uh, um, financial in inclusion, uh, regardless of whether you think of it as um, lo lower income, younger, uh, um, racial minorities, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, any other other panelists, uh, any of the task force members have questions? Oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Yeah, I was, uh, this is um, uh, Professor Bogan. I was just uh, just going to respond to your, your question to the group. I mean, I think it's, it's been said before, but um, I'm just beginning to do some work on sort of the unbanked and the underbanked population and looking a lot at the um, the FDIC National Survey of Unbanked and Underbanked and really trying to unpack uh, why, you know, the barriers to financial inclusion. And one of the things that struck me, I guess, is, you know, ex ante, I just, I thought that this was primarily relegated uh, an issue being underbanked for lower income households. Um, but what I see, it, just to my surprise, uh, kind of counter to my prior, is that there is a, you know, almost over 35% of middle income households um, are also underbanked, meaning they access um, alternative financial services. So I think, um, you know, as I start to do research, it's a bigger problem than, than a, a lot of people are aware. Um, and it's not solely for low income households. Um, households that have um, higher incomes are still plagued with um, issues with financial inclusion. And so I think um, one of the things that the, the data suggests is that the fee, fees are a big, this big um, way that households are discouraged from um, participating, engaging with financial institutions. And so I, you know, obviously comprehensive renew, review of fee regulation is, is important to understand and how this blocks not just the very low income, but a lot of middle income households as well. Well, I think access to credit should, I mean, uh, Todd, you, met, you said that it ought to be based on need. Well, it, it needs to be based on an ability to utilize it in a way that involves either self-development or the development of others and family or whatever. And... Uh, and 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 the the poor are perfectly capable of finding ways to do that. You see, and because I, I grew up among poor people, everybody was poor in the 1930s. <laughs> and but it but it didn't it didn't mean that people were uh, not able to to find ways to function and to utilize what little bit of money they could. Uh, Acquire in 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 ways that developed themselves or contributed to the family. It wasn't just a pure you know a, a, a consumption sink. It was a productivity uh, uh, source, and and I think somehow that sort of thing needs to be part of the inclusion, so that people understand that this is for self or other development. You see. Uh, <clears throat> And that there be some kind of evidence that this is what what it's going to be used for. Being cold before we leave this, um, everybody else has weighed in. I wanted to see if you have any thoughts on um, this. You've obviously talked about fringe tech earlier. Yeah, I wondered if you have any further thoughts on financial inclusion questions. I, I, I absolutely do, and I'm glad that you used the term financial inclusion uh, because I think that the term un unbanked or underbanked is psychologically constraining. Uh, and the reason is that it elevates the role of banks in our economy. Banks have historically been important. Uh, banks have uh, changed over throughout our history, but banks are increasingly under pressure because of the constraints, particularly imposed by uh, brick and mortar uh, um, uh, monetary systems. Uh, much of the world, and I would argue possibly now, most of the world is cashless. Um, China has become an, almost an entirely cashless economy. 
you either uh, use one of two kinds of payment systems in China, either uh, WeChat Pay or Alipay. Uh, much of sub-Saharan Africa is completely cashless, uh, largely because uh, it reduces the, the crime of theft. Um, mobile money transfer is much more cons uh, um, uh, secure than uh, using cash payment systems. And financial technology has placed banks all around the world under tremendous pressure. And uh, that pressure is forcing banks, uh, and, and by the way, it doesn't just come from uh, technology, it also comes from other kinds of um, uh, institutions that have interfaces with uh, customers, like, uh, as, as you uh, mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Walmart is a great example. Walmart has become a bank for all intents and purposes to the poor in America. It's not a place where they can um, necessarily store wealth, but it is the place where um, uh, financial intermediation and in particular transactional services are uh, accomplished for, for much of the poor where they don't have access to banks. Uh, banks now are increasingly um, um, focusing their attention on uh, segments of the economy where they are, have less competition uh, for um, transactional services. So when it comes to, especially with regard to um, the poor uh, and uh, people who have limited uh, means, um, banks are largely now ceding that uh, territory to, to FinTech and uh, other uh, developments, including uh, institutions like uh, uh, Walmart, uh, where if you walk into a Walmart today uh, at the front of the store at customer service, uh, it looks an awful lot like a bank with, with the lines and everything else that, uh, that are associated <laughs> with, with, uh, with banks. So um, uh, I, I don't like using the term unbanked or underbanked because that elevates banks, and banks are really um, – now losing uh, in this competition in the marketplace. Uh, and we need to think more broadly as to how to protect consumers in a, uh, in a more global um, uh, financial services industry than just simply uh, focusing on how to regulate banks. You know, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, we're now up to our final topic, and it's exactly. making me really sad because these two hours have been very provocative, and I wish we had more time. But our final topic is on regulatory modernization and flexibility, and the development of the national economy of consumer finance led to the growth of consumer protections in the 1960s and 70s, and this was the impetus for the National Commission on Consumer Finance that the director mentioned uh, at the outset this afternoon. And today, consumers shop for and use financial products very differently than we did 50 years ago, as we've been discussing. So I would like to ask each of our panelists in our final 15 minutes uh, to take three minutes to share their thoughts on the following questions. How do we protect consumers from new threats while enabling providers to develop new and better ways to serve their needs? Second. The pandemic has highlighted the need to ensure that the federal government can quickly adjust and provide regulatory flexibility. And indeed, just the way the market evolves uh, shows us the need for regulatory flexibility. Uh, so how do we create a system that is responsive to acute market disruptions like 9-11 or the 2008 financial collapse or COVID or just to the rapid evolution of products while providing a stable regulatory framework for consumers. And I'll let you fight to see who goes first. Well, <clears throat> you see, when I, when I think of the, the main charge that this Bureau has, and the way it came about. And what we've been talking about has all involved sort of endogenous uh, problems and issues that arise in consumer markets. They're not really 
the kind of thing where you have an external threat. And and it's not clear to me that this is an area that, that you have any or, or, or any uh, special <clears throat> uh, competence to take on. You you can be part of assisting other government agencies in the event of another 9-11 or another COVID. Okay. But it seems to me that involves kinds of expertise. And whatever the source, the external threat is, those will have special characteristics requiring special uh, competence and knowledge. And, and the question is, what can you contribute to that beyond sort of a, of a secondary supplemental uh, role as one of the many agents that might, uh, you know, help other agents? But it seems to me not uh, – uh, you, in a sense, have enough to do, okay, <laughs> In in the in the main charges you have, and that we have, and that we've been talking about here, and <clears throat> and so I would question whether those things aren't uh, really beyond your authority in terms of commitment of any kind of of resources to that that uh, require an expertise that. It uh, diverts you, I think, from your main, your your main charge and your main function. Thank you, Professor what? Bogan. Do you have thoughts on this? Yes, I, I actually um, agree a hundred percent with per Professor Smith, um, especially when you think about the market disruptions that you highlighted in your question: nine eleven, uh, two thousand eight financial collapse. COVID, you know, 9-11 is a security issue. <laughs> uh, the financial collapse was in our financial market. COVID is a public health crisis. And so I think that it's important to make sure this organization is elevated so that when there is a, a crisis, they're kind of plugged in uh, and people look to you as the, um, a resource uh, and that the organization is nimble enough to be able to react as quickly as possible to, you know, whatever issue is, uh, has been foisted upon us. But I definitely concur with Professor Smith that it seems like it's a little bit outside the purview to be able to create a system that's responsive to health issues and um, security issues um, in addition to financial issues, uh, and just trying to be um, nimble is the most important because, you know, technology is evolving at an um, increasingly more rapid rate. And so, in general, I think um, government organizations are going to have to be um, more nimble. Thank you. Um, I'll add, yeah, I'll add that um, I, I think... Um, every, I mean, crises can't be predicted. You couldn't predict a pandemic. You can't predict something like 9-11. But you can predict events that um, hurt the most vulnerable people. When anything goes down in the just normal recession, I mean, these things are just inevitable and they, you know, history rhymes, right? Um, so in that way, um, and every crisis of any sort of nature ends up affecting those who are vulnerable the hardest. And so I think this is the job of this agency and others um, to make sure that those systems are in place before the crisis, to not be um, reactive. So, you know, to get those, um, and this is not just obviously the CFTB's um, issue across the board. I mean, the fact that we don't have a system of sending out um, easily payments to every American, you know, when we need to, um, seems a system, systematic problem that's hard to fix in the face of an emergency, but maybe, you know, before that, kind of anticipating uh, how, how these things uh, might, might affect people. And, and again, a lot of these issues that have been coming up are not, like, blindingly new. There's a lot of academics and researchers who have been saying, I am among them, who have been 
paying, uh, saying pay attention to this payments issue, pay attention to these um, inclusion uh, issues. I'm not going to get hang up on, on, hung up on terms, what we're going to call it. Um, the point is that some people don't have access to a bank account, and some of those people are, are you know, uh, not, not just poor people. They're, they're middle-income people. There are high fees. All of these issues are, are there, have been there, and they just get – pressed on and are heightened uh, in an emergency. And, and so I think, yes, now is not the time to sort of all, you know, to, to do this. And, and I don't think the CFPB is the only uh, agency or, or maybe even the primary one. Uh, but certainly uh, these things are going to come up repeatedly. So it is uh, upon us to, to, to fix them when we can. Thank you, Dean Cole. Yes, uh, so uh, I agree with, mu with much of what's been said, but I think that there's something really instructive from the public health crisis of COVID-19 um, for uh, you and for all regulators. The question you have to ask yourself is whether you want to be Florida or you want to be Illinois. If there was an immediate federal response to uh, COVID-19 that was the response of the state of Florida, this uh, public health crisis would be an utter disaster. However, if there was a federal response that was the response of the state of Illinois, um, we might look like South Korea right now. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that different states have taken different approaches, and those different approaches are ones that we can learn from so that when it's time to impose federal regulation, you will have had the learning of the laboratory of the states. But to immediately jump in when there's a new technology or a new financial uh, product that's uh, created, to immediately jump in with federal regulation runs the risk of creating a regulatory parallel to Florida's response to COVID-19 rather than Illinois' response to COVID-19. That's the whole point that I'm, I've been trying to make about um, the benefit of the laboratory of the state and state consumer protection as a way in which um, uh, you as a federal regulator can learn uh, and, um, and um, create better regulatory instruments. With that, no, Matt, I... I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, well, excuse me, Todd. I didn't mean to cut you off. Talk fast, Todd. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everybody, for this uh, uh, stimulating discussion. This has been uh, very helpful, and um, I'm sure our staff um, has been writing down references because um, I've written down a bunch of references, uh, if they didn't, of, uh, of work that uh, we, we need to now uh, go back and look at. Uh, this was a wonderful discussion and very wide-ranging and very helpful uh, for us and gives us a lot of food for thought and a lot more work to continue doing. So thank you for taking the time for, these, uh, for this great discussion. Um, I'd, so I'd like to thank, of course, all of, the, uh, all of the, uh, those who spoke today, all the participants. Um, I'd like to also take the opportunity to thank again Director Kraninger for, uh, for being here and our, our incredibly uh, hardworking and talented staff uh, who are supporting the task force, um, who are doing a lot of the uh, a lot of the work uh, on this, and so I just want to have a chance to recognize them here. And they were really the ones who put this whole thing together today, including uh, figuring out all the technical technology challenges and everything else. So, um, so they're the ones who make this work. And so I want to thank Matt um, and uh, who's our staff, been our staff director for the staff that, uh, uh, on behalf of Think Matt, uh, for all of the staff, for all the great work that they've been doing. So, and I want to thank all of you who um, joined us online or by phone, um, and please be on the lookout for our next public engagement, which we plan to be in the fall. Um, and so, until then, I hope everybody has a great, um, a great rest of the summer, and this uh, concludes today's uh, public hearing. Thank you for being with us today.